There are a few big picture concepts worth understanding if you want to follow the numerous happenings and news stories about those happenings connected to climate change these days. First is that a lot of the issues we're seeing today are connected to the greenhouse effect, which has been amplified by human activity. In brief, that means our planet's natural propensity to lock in some of the heat we receive from the sun, because the atmosphere keeps some of it from bouncing back into space, is made more potent because of all the CO2 and other greenhouse gases like methane we have pumped up there. These gases are keeping some of the heat that would have normally escaped in prior eras from escaping, and that means like an ever more effective greenhouse, Earth is holding on to more heat than it would have before the Industrial Revolution. We've benefited mightily from the Industrial Age and what's come after, and we had little reason to think this would be an issue for a long time. But the science on this isn't really under serious contention anymore. The only real questions are related to the scope, scale, and rapidity of environmental changes we will face as a consequence of having so much more heat energy in our otherwise enclosed system. Those questions, and the reason we have so many, despite also having just remarkable amounts of data, and quite a few answers these days as well, are related to the second big picture concept that's worth understanding, that everything climate related is incredibly, mind-bogglingly complex and interconnected. These are not simple systems, they are all interwoven with each other in obvious and invisible ways. And that means when we tweak one variable over here, bazillions of other variables in completely different places are also tweaked, sometimes in big overt ways, and sometimes in ways we won't notice for decades, if ever. This is part of why it took us so long to start addressing these issues. It's hard to notice some of them, and those we have noticed and raised alarms about have been easy to ignore argue against, or dismiss as politically or economically inexpedient. More of these issues have become obvious and pressing seeming to the average person, though, and that's made it easier for messaging about these topics to be both disseminated and believed, whereas in prior decades, most people just had to take some nameless, faceless scientist's word for it, and that's not always going to carry the most weight with many people even if those scientists are preeminent experts on whatever it is they're talking about. Folks are beginning to see their day-to-day -day experience change, and that has moved the conversation forward. And then third, it's important to recognize that this conversation and the dissemination of information about this collection of topics is cluttered with good faith misinterpretations, bad faith misinformation, and outright propaganda from entities that stand to lose a whole lot if and when we ultimately pivot from where we have been toward where we need to be. Fossil fuel interests in particular will see a lot of their wealth generating assets oil fields and gas reserves and all the expensive infrastructure they have built to exploit these types of resources converted into stranded assets, unutilizable and possibly even costing them money to maintain and repair and close or otherwise manage in a safe and less emitting fashion. Entities connected to those entities, too, stand to lose a great deal. Governments with major fossil fuel industries like Saudi Arabia and the United States have slow walked the shift toward renewables even when such a shift has made good financial and environmental sense. And through the lens of not wanting to lose all that income and all that power, the power associated with wealth and with controlling the dominant fuel of a given age, that slow walking makes perfect sense. No one wants to sign their own death warrant. And for many such entities, that's exactly what this represents. So that power shifting dynamic is playing a major role in how this all plays out from the dissemination of misinformation and bad faith arguments to active political and economic efforts to keep the current paradigm in place, because those who benefit most from the current paradigm don't want to lose that wealth and power, perhaps understandably. These three elements are useful lenses through which to view the current 
ongoing procession of extreme record-setting heat waves, which have been straining systems around the world over the course of what's now been declared the hottest June and hottest July on record, and possibly the hottest months for about 120,000 years. What I'd like to talk about today are some of the climactic consequences of these concepts and of the heat waves that we are experiencing. You're listening to Let's Know Things. I'm Colin Wright. If you're enjoying Let's Know Things, please consider becoming a paid supporter. Folks who support this show via patreon.com slash let's know things or at understandry.com gain access to an ad-free version of the show and a bonus episode each month. You also help perpetuate this show. You support its creation each and every week. And for that, I am truly grateful. All right, let's get back to the show. That claim about these having been the hottest months for about 120,000 years are, of course, difficult to prove. We have geologic and ice core data that tells us this is probably the case, but we do not have firsthand human recorded data from that far back. Since human civilization, when we started writing and building settlements and practicing agriculture and such, didn't begin until far more recently, mere thousands of years ago, ten thousands at the furthest extent. But the former claim that this is the hottest series of northern hemisphere summer months on record isn't in contention. The numbers coming out of temperature tracking stations around the world have been staggering with a northwest Chinese township recording a 126 degree Fahrenheit day in July, which is about 52.2 degrees Celsius, and Death Valley in the U.S. hit the low 130s degrees Fahrenheit, which is the mid-50s Celsius, the same month. Not terribly surprising there, as it's a region associated with high levels of heat, but the big surprise for Death Valley were the overnight highs, which clocked in at a record-setting 120 degrees Fahrenheit, which is just under 49 degrees Celsius. That's at night in the desert, when and where it typically gets cold. More inhabited and typically more habitable areas, like Phoenix, Arizona, have also been swelteringly hot this year, and it does get hot there often, but not this hot, and not for this long. Phoenix recorded high temperatures at or above 110 degrees Fahrenheit from June 30th through the end of July, a new record high temperature streak for the fifth most populous city in the United States. And for much of that period, the overnight temperatures were also debilitating, weighing in at around or above 90 degrees, which is just over 32 degrees Celsius. The city finally got a reprieve of a sort last weekend when the mercury only hit about 108 degrees or just over 42 degrees Celsius. Still a dangerous level of heat, but a tiny improvement over what they have seen for the better part of a month. Just over half the total U.S. population was sweltering under excessive heat warnings and advisories last week, about 170 million people in the U.S. alone and things are expected to get even worse in August. Temperatures at this level for this long are not just inconvenient and uncomfortable, they're dangerous. Excessive heat is the most deadly weather-related variable because of heat stroke, something that anyone can succumb to, but which is especially prevalent in people who are older, who work outside, and or who are simply not paying attention to what their bodies are telling them. And it can sneak up on you, so many people miss the signs that they are succumbing to it, especially if they've never lived through these sorts of temperatures before. And most people have not. This is new for pretty much everyone, even those who are veterans of previous heat waves. These are historic changes, and by all indications, we can expect more of the same in the future, except progressively worse. A popular dark joke in climate circles is that we will look back on this summer as the coolest one we can remember. And considering how blisteringly hot it has been already, that's a frankly terrifying possibility that is unfortunately backed up by the best available data and prognosticating tools. I mentioned before that these are not simple systems. All that data, all of these tools are evolving rapidly because there's just so much data to collect. 
so many numbers to crunch, and so many historical norms being violated that we are racing frantically to understand how to fit everything together. And at any given moment, our assumptions could turn out to be somewhat or massively inaccurate. Unfortunately, most of the inaccuracies we see these days are related to underprediction, not overprediction. We think the changes will be more moderate than they are, and then we are surprised when the heat intensifies even more than planned, or when storms increase in intensity by a far larger margin and much sooner than anticipated. This is likely the result of a certain amount of small c conservatism within the climate science world, no one wanting to be accused of overreacting, of being a chicken little, shouting that the sky is falling, crying wolf, and so on. But it's also probably the consequence of those aforementioned interconnected variables, causing cascades of reinforcing changes that are tricky to incorporate into our predictions. Looking at wildfires, for instance, it's been an historic year for those in many countries, and part of what has led to all that burning are the high levels of drought many of these now on fire areas have experienced. That drought is caused in part by the reshuffling of climactic systems that tweak the water cycle so that moisture arrives in different areas at different times and in different volumes than we've become accustomed to over the past few centuries. Thus, we have built for a different water cycle, and that has left us unprepared and with the wrong infrastructure for this new reality, which will leave some areas more parched, other areas more flooded, some areas parched, then immediately flooded, one right after the other. But those heightened levels of drought are a thing unto themselves, causing all sorts of issues with food and mass plant and animal die-offs and more erosion. And they also amplify wildfire season, and those wildfires then go on to churn huge volumes of CO2 into the atmosphere as they burn up all these trees and everything else, which then speeds up and amplifies the climactic changes that lead to those shifts in the water cycle, the reshuffling of where and how and how big droughts are, and yes, the emergence of larger and wider spread and harder to fight fires. That's just one of countless cascading systems that are currently spiraling out of control. Self-reinforcing in a way that is making everything connected to this topic worse, and in a way that we don't have a means of controlling for just yet. Which means we are likely to see more spiraling of this kind for the foreseeable future. And that means more and worse and wider spread, fires and droughts and floods, and the more holistic grand reshuffling of climate elements globally. We do have tools that allow us to survive these changes and even over time perhaps ameliorate them and reset and lock in some of the variables that are changing in such a way that they're sparking all this discombobulation. Air conditioners, for instance, allow folks who live in heat wave prone regions to survive, but our current energy generation circumstances means that these comfort and health related tools are part of the problem too. Powered as they are by fossil fuels, which in turn, like wildfires, make the issues causing the symptoms they help us survive worse. Shifting to more renewable energy sources can help us with this, as can using more efficient tools like heat pumps, which tend to be energy sipping compared to most AC systems, and which can serve as both heaters and air conditioners, reducing waste and allowing folks to live safely in more areas by allowing them to deal with more temperature fluctuations. These sorts of systems can also be integrated into rudimentary smart grids, which allow folks to plug their devices into moderation software that helps cities deal with energy fluctuations, preventing blackouts and brownouts during periods of high energy use, and utilizing community scale and home scale battery systems to tuck spare energy away in a backup when it's abundant, and then using that energy when it is most scarce and vital. There are simpler, lower tech efficiencies and remediations available too though. Simply painting surfaces white, and the more reflective the better, can help bounce heat from the sun back out into space, so that less of that heat makes it into the ground, raising surface temperatures, which then in turn raises air temperatures. This has the net effect of cooling everything, keeping the heat from settling where we don't want it, and it's especially valuable in areas where heat tends to settle into the ground and just sit there, like in densely populated cities. Planting more trees and other plant life also helps in this regard, lowering temperatures from the shade these plants create 
blocking that heat and absorbing a fair bit of it too, the plants converting that light energy into food for themselves, and the integration of solar panels can serve a similar purpose, blocking the sun, absorbing a lot of that energy, and turning it into electricity for us to use, rather than allowing it into the ground and into our infrastructure. And they can also provide shade for plants and animals and humans, and prevent evaporation when placed over water sources like lakes and reservoirs and canals. These sorts of climate-related issues, and that includes heat waves, but also increasingly powerful and irregular hurricanes, tornadoes, floods, and other such natural disasters, are expected to become more common, more powerful, and less predictable in terms of size and intensity, and in terms of where they land. More areas will have to deal with unfamiliar types of disasters, and that means a lot of damage and death and rebuilding. That rebuilding hopefully incorporating amelioration efforts and infrastructure, but all of which will be expensive and time-consuming. Already though, and again, we're just at the very beginning of this new paradigm in which everything is changing and becoming more intense. Already, the costs associated with these sorts of disasters are ballooning. In 1980, three such disasters, a drought, a flood, and a hurricane, each surpassed an inflation-adjusted $1 billion. In 2022, there were 18 $1 billion-plus disasters of this kind, six times as many including just one hurricane that was responsible for $114 billion in damage. Normal climactic fluctuations means these sorts of numbers will vary from year to year, but decade to decade, the average trend is toward more such disasters and higher and higher costs. And the annual cost to the U.S. alone for these sorts of disasters has been more than $100 billion in five of the last six years, with 2019 being the sole exception. Again, we will see fluctuations from year to year, but the decade scale average is showing a clear trend. The primary focus of most folks in this space is moving away from emitting energy sources like fossil fuels as quickly as possible, as that is the prime driver of these changes, and then doing whatever we can to soak up excess CO2 in the atmosphere, which over time, a long time probably, could help us nudge things back toward the more comfortable norms that we have built our societies around for the past several centuries. Beyond that, though, we are going to have to invest heavily in maintenance and rebuilding efforts, taking these new normals into account while also doing our best to not worsen the situation. All the changes we are seeing now, the consequence of contextually minor tweaks to climactic averages, which also means that if we continue along the path we're on, not nudging things in a different direction fast enough, those tweaks will become large-scale shifts, and what we're seeing today will seem laughably minor in comparison to what we would then face. If you're enjoying Let's Know Things, consider becoming a supporter. The simplest way to do that is to become a patron at patreon.com slash let's know things or a member at understandery.com. Folks who support this show monetarily gain access to an additional episode of the show each month, an ad-free version of the show, and you help perpetuate the creation of this show each week. A great big thanks to everyone who's already helping to support Let's Know Things and thank you in advance if you're considering doing so in the future. The book I'd like to recommend today is called Mickey Seven by Edward Ashton. I did not realize this until I started recording this episode, but this book is about to be turned into a movie that's supposedly going to come out in 2024. We'll see if that actually happens now with the strikes going on in Hollywood, but that movie will be called Mickey 17, and it will probably make a pretty good movie. It is a very good novel. Again, the novel is called Mickey Seven. The movie will be called Mickey 17. And it's a book about caste systems and people who are considered to be expendable within society. In this case, in a quite literal way, the main character, the protagonist, is an expendable who is shipped off to new colonies in space. And he is backed up using technology in such a way that he can go do dangerous jobs. And if he dies, then they can print a new Mickey. They can make another one of him. 
And that would seem to be a very cool superpower to be immortal in a way, but it also puts him in a very specific place within society that is close in a way to that of untouchables or similar cast members in contemporary day societies because of what he represents, because of the sorts of work that he has to do, and because of the way that people consider him to be expendable, not just in the work that he does, but in his place in society. So it's a fun core concept. It's an interesting use of technology. It's an interesting exploration of what that technology would mean if applied to real life. It's also just a pretty fun book. It's nice adventure science fiction. If you enjoy Elliot Pepper's work, or if you liked The Martian, those sorts of stories, this one would probably appeal to you as well. I certainly enjoyed reading it. And if any of that sounds interesting to you, consider picking up a copy of Mickey 7 by Edward Ashton. You can find out more about me and my work at colin.io. You can find the show notes and transcript for this and every episode of the podcast at letsknowthings.com. You can find my other news-centric podcast, One Sentence News, wherever you get your pods or at onesentencenews.com. And please feel free to reach out and say howdy on social media. I'm Colin is my name on Instagram and Twitter and Colin Wright on Facebook and YouTube. Thank you so very much for listening. I'm Colin Wright, and I'll talk to you again next week. Mm-hmm.